design the life you want, then make your business fit that. Hello and welcome to Pillars of Wealth Creation, where we talk about creating financial success with a special focus on business and real estate. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. Now, let's get to it. Hello and welcome back to Pillars of Wealth Creation. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. With me, excited to have Tarl Yarber. Tarl, how are you doing today? What's up, Todd? Thanks for letting me join your show. Absolutely, man. Well, I look forward to, uh, to uh, the conversation. I, quite frankly, I can't believe I have not had you on the show. I think I met, we met at the best ever conference back in like 2017, just a brief, you know, meeting back then, but uh, it, it changed know, my life. Yeah. So it, it was it, the, uh, it put me on a trajectory of great success. So I appreciate that handshake and uh, hopefully we'll continue to have <laughs> future great. success. It was all me. <laughs> it's all you. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, right. Well, a little bit about Tarl. He's the CEO and founder of Fixated Real Estate uh, in the uh, Pacific Northwest leading investment company with over 65 million in single family residential properties purchased, rehabbed, and resold over the last five years. So, um, man, since 2018, you and your wife have been able to travel six months out of the year. Is that, that that's amazing? And I I know you uh, you're not right now, but you were living in Maui for like was it an entire year? Thirteen months. 13 don't tell months. don't tell the state of Hawaii. <laughs> so, Man, that yeah. that is amazing. So we're gonna dive into how exactly you were able to do that because this is that's what this show was all about is not just buying a piece of real estate like a lot of real estate investors kind of do, you know, they just go mm -hmm. out and buy some real estate. They think they're a real estate investor. No, you became a business owner and uh, man, travel is six months out of the year. That's pretty crazy. So um, well, well, it goes back to that, uh, that original rich dad concept of the ESBI quadrants, the cash flow yeah. quadrant. And we, most of us think we're a business owner, but we're really in the S quadrant. We're self-employed. Yeah. And how do you cross over to the business or the I quadrant, the investor quadrant? And that's what we focus on. Well, let's, let's dive into that. But before we do, I just want to give you a little more opportunity to, to give a bit more about your background. Cause I, I know there's a lot and kind of what you're focused on today. And then we'll just dive into, you know, how have you been able to create some of those systems and what have you been able to do to be able to actually be able to do, you know, 13 months in Hawaii. Yeah. Yeah. There's some people that have lived Hawaii their whole lives and they don't brag about that. Right. But the, uh, for, but for us mainlanders, it's a big deal. Yeah. Um, no, yeah. A little bit about me, my favorite topic. Right. Uh, thank you for allowing me to talk about myself. Uh, the, so I started real estate back in 2005. Uh, the short, the longer version of that story is on a bigger pockets podcast, 189. Um, but essentially I stumbled into it. I just wanted to buy a personal development seminar uh, and in order to pay for the personal self development seminar, I bought a wholesaling seminar called how to turn $10 into $10,000 in 30 days or less. Hmm. I needed to make $10,000 in 30 days or less to pay off my credit card that paid for a personal development seminar that I bought prior <laughs> to that one. Cause I went to a sellathon, basically a big, huge conference with a bunch of gurus selling yep, and I was there. 20 years old and yeah, we've all been there yep. 20, 20 years old. And I didn't know what I was getting myself into, but that set me on a trajectory of, pain, sorrow, hardship, and eventually mm. success. So, um, but that's the very short cliff notes version. Uh, in 2010, 2011-ish, I went full-time in real estate officially uh, and moved up to the Seattle area. Done a little over 600 single family fix and flips over the last decade. Uh, and over the last few years, we've definitely focused mainly on the Pacific Northwest with our team. Um, I've worked my ass off for lack of a better word, grinded all that stuff for a period of time. And then late 2017, my wife and I came to kind of like a, like a moment where we're like, why are we doing any of this? Like we just work, work, work all the time. We're not enjoying our lives. I hate real estate. Um, what can we do differently? And my buddy Thatch basically came up with a, not came up. He basically said, he's like, Hey, why don't you just create your life the way you want it to be and make your business fit your life. Whereas most people create their business and then whatever they have left over, they make their life fit that. And right time, right place, right moment. When he said it, my brain was ready to receive that information, which I think you have to be ready for it. And when he said, design the life you want, then make your business fit that. 
I'm like, what? <laughs> you can do you can, that? You can do that? How, how's that? Yeah. Yeah. And like, no joke. So in a period of uh, over a month, my wife and I sat down every single weekend uh, with butcher paper out and started planning out. This is uh, October 2017, planning out like how we want our lives to look. Right. And, and then we just started doing it. And then, and part of that was we wanted to do less deals and be able to travel more and be together every day and have a team that focuses on systems and scaling and, and so forth to be able to allow us to work everything from our phones and not from a desktop or a laptop and shifted our thinking to be like, if the answer is I have to physically be at a place, then the answer is wrong. Hmm. And just kind of committing to that, that commitment to be able to say, no, I don't physically need to be anywhere to run my business. So how do we get it to that point? Uh, and that's a conversation we can get into, but the, and then through that, we decided that lifestyle was more important than income, which for some people is a hard pill to swallow. And it was for us because there's an ego play. There's a scorekeeping play in this business when you've been building up a lot of success and a lot of wealth that the time you decide to say, Hey, I would rather build assets and not build income, which when you flip houses, you're building income, you're not building yeah. assets. Uh, and I had a very high income. And then when we switched over in 2018 to more lifestyle, we had to build assets, right? So we had to start keeping properties as rentals and stuff. So my income dropped in 2018. And I felt like I was failing dramatically. But in reality, my net worth went up exponentially because I started keeping assets instead of flipping them. So it was a mental shift to realize making less money doesn't mean bad, right? Which is a bigger conversation. It just, where's it going? And also, are you successful for yourself? So that was, this, there's a lot to unpack here, but uh, I had to have a major shift in my head to realize that making tons of money was not what I wanted in my life. I wanted amazing experiences and to live my life every day with my wife and my friends and my family and to travel and have great experiences and not grind 80 hour weeks, 160 hour weeks, all the time for, for what money. And so yeah. that shifted my thinking forever. Um, and that's how we got started on being able to travel as much. We definitely crush it right now, but we enjoy our lives a hell of a lot more once we shifted our thinking to, to build wealth and assets and not just income and work our asses off. So. I mean, have listeners have, have you, and I don't know that I've done this. So this is a question for myself too. Have you really sat down and looked at what do you really want in, in your life? You know, we have these goals. Sometimes they get really big, but does that really, is that really serving you? And it sounds like that's what happened to you. You had these yeah. goals. You're doing these awesome things. I mean, you're flipping a ton of houses, building your business but it wasn't serving you. It was really actually making you just not happy. You, hated, and, you said you, I hated real estate. I, I mean, still do. <laughs> well, maybe you still do. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I love the lifestyle. I love the income, yeah. right? And I love my bank account, but the, uh, and our balance sheet, but it's at the end of the day, it's like, for me, it was accepting real estate's a vehicle for, to, to create the lifestyle I want. And it's not me yeah. though. So, yeah. and where I think a lot of us struggle and I still struggle in, is ex determining what your level of success is for your life and not giving a shit about what other people think. Yeah, that's like, the and, challenge. Yeah, it's who cares what the other investor is doing? Who cares that, oh, he's got a hundred unit apartment complex and I've only got like a single family. Like, so what, right? <laughs> the, what are you, what do you want in your business for yourself? Maybe you don't want to run a, a thousand unit portfolio once you know what that actually means, right? Maybe mm -hmm. your level of lifestyle only wants to have like 10 or 20, right? Or maybe you don't even want to do real estate. Maybe you don't want to be active. Like who cares what other people want in their lives? Focus on what you want in your life first and build that out and then, and be happy with that. Like if you want to sit around playing video games all day, great, create a lifestyle that allows you to do that. And forget the rest of society telling you that you're a loser. That's not true. If you're happy, you're probably happier than them. So uh, who are you listening to is a huge, huge factor uh, to pay attention to. So, yeah, right. There's so many people telling you to do certain things. And I mean, it, we talk about it all the time with success. Like, well, look, there's going to be all these people holding you back and limiting you because they, they, 
you know, they've got these certain beliefs, the same thing, same thing when you become successful, or when you start to have success, there's other people that are telling you, you got to do more and more and more. And okay. like you said, you're listening, you see these people posting, they just took down an 800 unit apartment complex or 300 unit or whatever it is. And it's congratulations. And they have 1% that's, ownership, but yeah. that's awesome. Right? <laughs> exactly. That's what yeah. I was just going to yeah. is just because you see somebody purchase a, you know, 200 unit apartment complex doesn't mean they've got any more equity value ownership than you have in the duplex you own, you know, free and clear. Totally true. And that's, that's a wake up call for some people. And I, I, spoiler alert, you can post whatever the hell you want on social media. I don't know know if you guys knew that or not, but like, there's no uh, truthfulness, like detector in that, even though despite (laughs) Maybe that's controversy right now, like right, right, the right. censorship bullshit. But anyways, that's yeah. the point. The for, but to that point, like I know people, I've seen it where I see people posting photos of them like on a private jet, like they own the freaking thing, yeah. and I'm like, uh, no, like you took a picture in a jet. So yeah. <laughs> <just> like, it's, <laughs> and oh, it, it Photoshop's a great thing, by the way. <laughs> but Photoshop huge. But a big wake up call for me, I think it was in 2016, if I remember correctly, I went to a conference where I was, I thought I was a little fish. Uh, and it was a, uh, it was a single family forum where you had some of the largest funds uh, in the US that bought single family homes there. And my buddy and I at the time were walking around and we're thinking like, okay, well, I do, you know, 40, 50 houses a year and do this or that, whatever. And like, but these guys have like a thousand properties or these guys flip 200 properties a year or these guys. And then we start talking to these people and we realize, wait, no, they're just an employee of that fund or they, uh, they might be the fund manager, but they're only like a small portion of the GP, like general partnership, uh, or they do an 80, 20 split. Right. And they only have 20% of the assets, but then that's split amongst like 18 employees and like all this other crazy stuff. And I'm like, wait, I make way more money than these people yet. They're portraying like they're huge volume based in some way, but like, my little houses, you can do 10 flips and make more money than these people or five or whatever. And it kind of woke me up to realize that it's not a, it's, it's not so much when somebody says they have a hundred million dollars as assets under management. Cool. Do they sign the deeds? Like, do they, are they actually the what's people that, that run it? Like, what's that actually mean? Right. Don't be impressed by that. And who cares if they have a hundred million assets under management Honestly. too, right? Yeah. Like focus on yourself and what you want for your life. Uh, and, and stop looking at social media too, but yeah, I like uh, what you said. Uh, you, uh, you you said to there's for- a lot of money's out there right now. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you said to forget. I, I can't remember exactly what you said, but you basically said to forget what other people are saying or thinking or wanting. But are you successful for yourself? Right, and that's a huge question. And and I wrote that down. Yes. Are you successful for yourself? And that's that's so important to to just be thinking about. So. There's a great book out there uh, by a man named uh, Gay Hendricks, right? And the book is called uh, The Five Wishes, and it changed my life And uh, in my 20s. And it had to do with, like, you're on your deathbed right now, Todd. You're going to die today. Sorry. Uh, and yeah. I come up and ask you a question. I say, was your life a success or not? Yes or no? And there's only two answers, yes yeah. or no. Yeah. And if it's a no, then why was that? give me three reasons or four reasons why you believe your life was not a success. And if your answer is yes, then give me three or four reasons why you believe your life is a success. But the key to that, when I asked myself that question through that book, it made me realize that like I was living based off of what I thought other people wanted and not what I really wanted. Um, I had an ego and I had an inferiority complex that kind of came out of that book that I didn't realize that I had a struggle with that I had to get over and realize that like, I'm trying to portray myself as something bigger and better than I am because I care what other people think too much and it's making me unhappy and internally. So that, that was a great wake up call for me on that book and allowed me to focus on what I wanted in my life more. Uh, and with my level of success that I, that I dreamed of, right. And whatever that might be for you is different than somebody else. Yep. Love it, man. Love it. So 600 flips, um, but you're traveling now. Yeah six months of the year or more. Yep. Mm-hmm. So what do you, what are you doing now? One, two? Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. None. No, no. Uh, so the, that's not true at all. Um, we average between eight and 10 active flips at a time still. Um, and we do single family rentals as well. So we do the burst strategy buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. Uh, I also have a lending company that we own fixated funding. 
uh, that we lend out to other investors, experienced investors only, sorry, new people that are doing uh, flips and, uh, or rentals and stuff. Or rentals. So we can do, yep. So single family rentals, single family flips. Uh, we also do some small multifamily. We do portfolio loans. Uh, so we have a company that we own that does that as well. Fixated funding. Um, we do a, we have our events company that we also host and run. Uh, we have a new conference coming out June 9th, 10th and 11th in Scottsdale at the Westin Kierland. Ken McElroy and I, if you guys don't know Ken, he wrote the book of ABCs of real estate investing. Uh, and that book changed a lot of people's lives. It was one of the first good real estate investing books yep. out there. Uh, he has over 10,000 units. Great freaking dude. Legit guy when you see him and you talk to him or if you meet see him on youtube that's him like he really is like that cool of a dude right down to earth kind down of to earth dude. like i love this guy uh anyways him and i are partnering on limitless the financial freedom expo so if you go to limitless.com sorry limitless expo.com limitless expo.com uh you can get your tickets for that and we have kiyosaki robert kiyosaki is a headliner and a lot of other people uh that are big names that are coming out it's not just a real estate event it's a financial freedom expo and now more than ever there's so much chaos and confusion in the market and what to do and what to where to place your capital or how to build entrepreneurship in a business and should now be the time to do it or not and there's so much confusion out there and we want to bring this conference to help um, eliminate some of that confusion give people confidence in what they're doing but it's also an expo too so we have about 60 plus exhibitors uh, and no sales from the stage no bullshit, right? Truth and education only and networking. That's what we're about. So anyways, doing that too. And then uh, the, and then of course we still invest in real estate and I do JVs with people and provide capital, my own capital uh, as well. And so it's got a lot going on, but still travel, still so do it from my phone. Yeah. I mean, look, you, you got eight to 10 flips going on at one time. You got a, a lending business. You're buying single family, keeping them for rentals. You've got this, um, you know, education conference, uh, man, I mean, and, and it's, you, you changed it too. You were just recently, right. Yeah. You had one conference. How many, how many years you, were you running the, the last conference? Our last conference was called the big badass real estate wealth expo. And we ran that for five years until COVID. Uh, we did yeah. a virtual conference for 1800 people in 2020 as a, uh, as a way to pivot and just keep the lights on for that. Uh, and then I didn't do anything in 2021 other than the masterminds that Brandon and Turner and I run in Maui together. Um, so now you're, and you're running masterminds. I mean, mm -hmm. so you're doing all this stuff. I guess my question is, how are you doing that all and still maintaining your sanity? Cause it just sounds like a ton of stuff to try to juggle, like dig in and give us some like tips and, and what you're actually doing here. No, I appreciate that. Um, the, so this is my favorite topic is business systems and scaling. Like it's running an actual business is, is yeah. my favorite topic. And so yeah. a lot of us, yeah, a lot of us get in real estate investing and I've met a lot of successful business owners that have ran successful companies, not real estate, but outside of it, manufacturing or some sort of SaaS uh, business or whatever that all of a sudden switches into real estate. And it's something about real estate that makes most people forget all business acumen whatsoever. And they go straight into DIY mentality. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but I've seen a number of business owners that have 80 employees and systems and processes all over the place, but they get into the real estate. They feel like they have to physically do everything themselves. And you're like, yeah. no, it's still a business. Right. And the, <laughs> the, the second that we accept that the easier it is for us to see how to run it. Now, when you're brand new, that's a little bit harder because you you can't even see the anything. You can't see the tree or the forest. You, there's nothing yeah. there. You don't even know where the forest is, right? Because you're yeah. brand new wherever you are. Um, that's where education comes in. That's where you got to listen to podcasts like these and uh, really immerse yourself in the direction you want to go. That said, if most of us are in the business somehow, we buy real estate somehow, uh, somewhere. And the first question is, you know, you ask yourself, or I had to ask myself is like, how do I want my real estate business to run, right? What's the, um, what's my absolute nose? Like basically what won't I do, right? What won't I uh, allow myself to do at all in the business? And if I have that lens, when I build out my business, then I know what the hell no's are, right? But I also need to know what the hell yeses are too. So as an example, 
when we decided to switch over to, to in late 2017 to be more of a lifestyle business, one of the absolute hell knows was I have to physically be somewhere. So that meant we had to build all our processes and all our systems and use all our software and hire the right people if we had to have the right people or boots on the ground or whatever to make it to where I can still confidently run the business without physically having to be at a location. Now, if there's always a catch that says, I don't want, I will physically not be somewhere unless, and then A, B, C, D excuse, right? Yep. Then you're yep. always going to side with that, right? Yeah, you're so, good. Unless comes up more often. Correct. Yeah. But if it's like gone out the window, like, no, there is no unless, there is yeah. just no physical way, then you have to get creative. So the four hour work week, uh, which should be updated in my opinion, because of some of the, uh, but it's not, but the four hour work week was a book that changed my life um, to be able to help me build that kind of mentality and system hmm. of being able to create process and think things differently. The other two books was the one thing by Gary Keller, which yep. let me focus on what I'm best at, uh, which yep. for me is strategic networking. And then the, uh, the third book was checklist manifesto. Uh, by Atul Gawande. And that book, I've actually just reread it again for like the fourth time, but the uh, that book helped me kind of figure out how to simplify processes and checklists and so forth, which is a great book. But those three books gave me the perspective to start like going, okay, how do I take myself out of this? How do I get other people to do it? The other, now how we actually do it as an example is we leverage software and we leverage people. So um, we use a program called Asana, A-S-A-N-A. Uh, Smartsheet and Dropbox are our three main tools that we use for software. How we use them is probably different than other people, but the, and you're not going to learn everything from this podcast, sorry, <laughs> but yeah, right. this is um, just, a, just a taste. Yeah. Get your mind thinking the yeah. right way, really. Yeah. And so like we looked at those tools and we used to use a program called Basecamp, uh, but I switched over to Asana. Mm. So Asana is just a project management software and it's not, yep. It's not specific to any type of um, right. company or thing or whatever. There's other construction project management softwares out there like Builder Trend that are way better, but meant for construction and stuff. Asana yeah. is just a general project management software, right? Like Trello or whatever. Um, so I liked it a lot. So we use that and we just make, we use that to, to build out like our standard operating procedures for the houses that we buy, right? I also use it for my personal stuff. Like goals and just fun stuff and travel. Like I use Asana for everything, mm -hmm. um, but I've built it into my life to use that. And then I leveraged the checklist manifesto to kind of like help me manage the, the Asana a little bit better uh, so we can make it effective. So we use that for all project management and then we use Dropbox for all file storage and photos. So something simple that I think everybody should do, especially if they're in the like real estate world uh, is take photos, right? Of the properties. Yeah. And so something we do, you know, every single week is we have somebody go out to our properties and take a hundred to 150 photos of each property. Hmm. This is something that always seems to confuse people, right? Like why, if, why are you taking a hundred photos of a two bedroom, one bath, 600 square foot house, right? You can probably get that done with like 10 photos. So it's true. But for me, I'm like, I'm not physically there. We actually have a, an exact process of how we want people to take photos. So you start from the exterior, you go around it from uh, the entire exterior, including the surrounding area and street. And then you go in through the front door and you take photos of the rooms in each certain way. And every single week, the photos are taken the same way in a, in, for the most part, probably 90% accuracy every single week. Now, why do we do that? One, the number one reason is I'm not the one there. So how am I supposed to know what the property looks like yep. without the photos? Yep. Now, do I look at the photos all the time? No, I got somebody else on my team that does that now. But if I ever want to, I need to know with confidence, I can go to any folder on that property and they're, and they're uh, organized in a certain way and pull and up the track photo them by date too. Correct. We track them by date. We, that's exactly what we do. Uh, and I can pull it up and I'm not going to be lost where this person is. I know where they are because of how they took the photos and I can see the rehab. I can see the construction issues because they're taking 120 photos of a 600 square foot house. Right. So we see everything. And and every week we docu we're able to document that. There's a lot of other reasons why we take photos that have to do with like legal reasons. And if a mm. contractor misses out on something, we catch stuff like a trade pisses off another trade and we can go back to previous photos. You know, there's so much stuff that it's helped us with. Yep. But the number one reason, I'm not there. So the owner of the company, me, needs to be able to look at those photos whenever I want. And let's imagine that you're investing out of state. 
Well, you can't be there. You can't, you can't jump on a plane every time something goes wrong. Right. So, and why would you want to do that? Right. Unless you want to get away from your family, but that's a different conversation. So, but the, so if that's the case, then how do you develop a process where your boots on the ground are able to get you the information you need to be able to run your project, however that might be. So we do that. Now we use Smartsheet, which please don't buy Smartsheet if you're listening to this, uh, unless you want to like really build out something crazy. So uh, Smartsheet is like an overpriced spreadsheet that can do an amazing amount of stuff if you actually put the time, energy, and effort into using it. If you don't, just go get Google Sheet and move on with your life, right? Yeah. But, um, the, but we use Smartsheet like crazy though. So, and we use Smartsheet for all of our actual processes, like uh, our scopes of work, our finished packets, um, the actual tangible things we need to be able to do our checklists and stuff like for contractors are all built through Smartsheet. So, um, and that leverages through our, our budgets um, are all linked into Smartsheet. Our scopes of work are all linked in there. Our finishes are all linked in there. And that took years to get to that point to where we have it all processed out, but it came with the mentality of how do we do this once and never do it again? Hey, the North Star Real Estate Conference is back. It's May 2nd and 3rd, and this year it's a bit different. We're going to be hammering in on multifamily real estate, and we're going to show you asset management, value add strategies, raising millions of dollars through syndication, and how to find those hidden gems in today's market that are just so tough to find. And one of the biggest things I'm excited to bring you is industry experts that you're going to be able to put on your team so you can hit the ground running day one. So join us. May 2nd and 3rd at the North Star Real Estate Conference. Look forward to seeing you there. And I'll give you an example with flipping houses. Finishes. I hate finishes. I'm colorblind, right? Uh, with reds and blues and stuff. I could see them, but not the same way you guys see them. I'm not the one that should be picking. Everything should just be gray finishes if I'm picking it out, right? But the it's... I hate picking them out. I never want to deal with them. I don't want to have anything to do with them. It's not my style. Um, and not what I'm good at. So why should we choose a different finish every time we do a property, right? There's no point, right, to that. There should be different levels of finishes based off of the quality of the property, where it's located, that kind of thing in the geographic area um, or neighborhood or whatever, but there shouldn't be like different ones every freaking time, yeah. unless you love it. It's not your blank canvas that you express your artistic ability on. It's a commodity that you're investing in, right? Yeah. So that said, we have, we have systemized our finishes. So we have finished packets that we've created through our smart sheet so that we don't have to think about the finishes. We can look at the comps for the ARV after repair value and say, okay, this area, it pref prefers like a modern type style home. So we go to our finished packet and we just click all the modern finishes and then it prints out and we hand it to our contractor. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel every time we do it. How do we do it one time and then never do it again, right? Yep. Yep. When we make our scopes of work, how do we make the scope one time and have it as accurate as possible so we don't have a bunch of change orders later and have to do it again, right? So it's, I just talked to somebody about this yesterday and we use the term like, you got to slow down to go fast. And that's probably the biggest thing that I've gotten over the years in this business is learning how to slow down so we can go fast. And I'm rambling a lot, Todd, you give me the mic, so I'm going, but the, uh, for and why that's been huge for us, my biggest mistakes in our business have come because we've rushed into things quickly, right? And the issues pop up halfway through a project or later at the end of the project because we miss things because we're so like ticking clock, time is money, go, 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 like all that kind of stuff. And we, I, today, I have no problem sitting on projects for weeks on end until we know everything that needs to be done to the project. And it's surprising how fast the project goes once we know everything we're going to do on the project, we have it planned out, right? And it's amazing how long the project takes if we just rush into it. And does yeah. that make sense? A hundred percent. I mean, right right now I'm dealing with that on, on one project. We rushed into it. We wanted to get going on it. We didn't have things in line. And it's it, it's been a fight the entire time, right? Yeah. We're, we're fighting. It's It's just like every single... Now, finally, now it's, it's going smooth. Right. But for a long time, it was like, we're just fighting ourselves and we got another project and we literally took, I, I bet it was an extra three weeks. It sat there for three weeks, no work, but we went through and got everything ready to go and everything, all the materials ordered, 
all that mm-hmm. stuff. And it's just so much easier yeah. doing that. <laughs> Yeah, just take it, take way an extra couple time. weeks. Like, yeah, way less time. I mean, yeah, you spent, we spent a little bit of time up front to do the boring stuff. And now, now our hands are off of it instead of like banging on the freaking wall every single day, trying to, trying to pound something through. And, and I think, uh, so something to, to your point, what you all said too, like kind of add on to what, uh, as well is that one of the ways that I like to kind of challenge people or challenge myself, right? Mostly is we just got done with a project, right? Or we just got, you know, how do you, do you do an after actions report? Like, do you sit there and analyze how, what went right? What went wrong? Mm. What could have been done differently? Do you do that with every project or not? Yeah. Right. And can you change a good project should be like, yep, everything went right. And our processes worked and it should never be, we got lucky, right? It should be like, yeah, it should be like, out. this happened because of this, right? Yeah. We did this, our budget was that, why was it over? Let's figure out why, cool. Was that something we could have uh, foreseen or not? That's the biggest thing. And is this a repeatable mistake? Like something funny and silly that we talk about is that dry, dryer vents, for instance, like just to throw that out there. We've done so much heavy remodels and I can't tell you how many times we've forgotten a dryer vent, right? <laughs> so for just something so stupid that has come out of our active action reports, we're like, this is like the fifth house we forgot to put a dryer vent in. Maybe we should put that into our process. Like, but it could also be like you learned that hey, during COVID and during lockdown and during all the supply chain issues, you look at your budget and you go like, why are we twenty percent over budget? This is ridiculous. We're failing. But when you sit down and do an after action report, you go like, no, the team has done everything they can. We were just there are times where we just can't uh, foresee what's going to happen in the world that made it all of a sudden. Windows take five months to get or something along those lines that are out of your control. But what can we do differently now that we know the world is stupid in that sense? Well, that means that like Windows, I'm using that because that's a problem for a lot of people right now is, well, as soon as we buy a house, the very first thing we do is we need to get a window package going now yep. because we know it's going to be a couple months before we yep. can get them or whatever, right? Well, so our appliances six weeks appliances, ahead of time versus exactly. three days. And if you're and if you're not doing your after action reports, if you're not analyzing where your challenges are or adapting yep. to what's going on, you're going to keep getting you know kicked in the teeth. Uh, every time there's a change. Um, and, and that's something that we, we do our best. We're not perfect at it. Trust me. We screw shit up yeah. all the time, but, the, <laughs> but being aware that we screwed it up and I'm, then I'm going to let you talk here in a second. Sorry, Todd. But one more thing that we do is, uh, that I like to challenge people on is you've had success. You've done your business. You, maybe you, you've, you have 800 units or whatever. Like, and I asked you, cool. How did you do that? Right. Or can you show you, show me a way that you duplicate that process? Yeah right? Can you do it again? Do you, you know what you did something. right? Do you know what you did wrong? Right? Do you have an SOP for it? And unfortunately, a lot of people in our industry and in our business, like, they don't know how they got where they are. <laughs> like, they just, I just, you know, I just put my head down. And I gave it my all. And I just grinded like the next and like, that's their answer. I'm like, okay, that's you can't duplicate that shit. You don't know what you did. So the and that's comes from just winging it all the time and grinding and going and grinding yeah. and going and grinding and going, which We've all done, but yep. being able, the only way to get out of that grind and go is to sit back and go like, okay, how do we duplicate this process? How do we make a system around this? How do we make an SOP around this? How do we put bodies in front of it? Like, do we want to do this any further? Yes or no. It's that reflection and that awareness uh, is so key in order to get out of the the grinding, the rat race, that kind of thing, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, it's so easily left out or forgotten about. And, and I've never really put a term to it, but I do it quite a bit that the after action report, but now that you said that now it's like, okay, now we're, we're going to do a report after everyone. I mean, we, we will sit down and we say, what did we do? What did we do wrong? What could we have done better? All that kind of stuff. But now it's like, all right, let's make a, an after, I, I love that, that term, the after action report. And let's really hammer it down. And it goes back to what you said before. You've got to slow down in order to go fast. And yeah. that allows you to slow down, look at what you did, what you did right, what you did wrong, and what could you do better. And then create a plan. And you're always going to be tweaking it, right? But if you do right. that every single time, you're going to get to a pretty good spot. It needs to be part of our process, which is, yeah. okay, we're done with the project. What went right? What went wrong? What can we learn from? And it's not a time of grief. It's not a grieving. It's not a time to, uh, uh, to bitch. There you go. For like yeah, it's, not, it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily to beat yourself up and say yeah. how bad you did. 
Correct. It's just like, what went right? What can we change differently? Or else you fall into the whole definition of insanity, which is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. And that's, that's something that I've seen more than once. They're like, I keep the world just, this keeps happening. Every project that I'm like, (laughs) <laughs> okay there's only one commonality in all of this going on here right so that's you, you. so yeah and they don't it's you got to sit down and say what can i do differently what's a little you know and it yeah. seems counterintuitive depending on what guru you listen to and what seminar you bought sometimes but uh this is a business so run it like one right can can you always my litmus test is, is can i actually teach somebody how mm-hmm. to do this without spending a whole like six days prepping how to teach them. Right. Uh, Like, can I just, can I go, here's how we do it. Like, can I open my computer up and show them this is the program we use? Can I tell them the processes we take, you know, if, if I can't teach, which is one thing I actually love about speaking at conferences, uh, be, you know, speaking at uh, on podcasts, uh, mentoring people is I actually have to slow down a little bit and go, okay, yeah, well, uh, yep, I got these processes in place. Am I am I doing things the right way? Mm-hmm. So, totally. um, what's what's a mistake that you've made along the way? <sighs> How much time have you got? Yeah, just 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 one, maybe two at the most. But just yeah. just one thing that you've a mistake that you made. How have you learned from it? Maybe how are you implementing your business today? And so our listeners can really uh, learn from it. So full disclosure, I, I truly believe that my mission on life is to, in life is to be a, be a martyr and make every freaking mistake there is known to man in, yeah, might as well, right? in real estate. Yes. So that I can learn from it and to help other people <laughs> learn from it too. Cause, cause I'll tell you what, like I, especially in the single family world, I don't know a mistake that I haven't made yet. And I hope I've made them all, but like the, uh, it'd be great to know I've made them all, but there's always some freaking thing that pops up that you're like, I could have never seen that shit coming. <laughs> so you're like, yep. you think you have it figured out, but you don't. So um, I have actually, I have a whole presentation that is kind of a fun one. Whenever I want to have a good time is that, uh, well, not a good time for me, but good time for the audience. But the, when it's a breakdown of all the big mistakes that I've made, but what that's taught me in the, yeah. in the business. That's really and, cool. I, I'd yeah. love to listen to that. That That's great. I think th- so many people kind of just brush by that, right? We, it's so easy to talk about your successes. Oh. It's fun, right? I mean, no, it's, everybody wants it's, to l- listen to how cool you are. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm so cool. Right. The, uh, for, but no, as far as some of the big ones for one is the slowdown, right. Which you talked about, like yeah. some, there's sometimes like, I can get into this pretty in depth. So give me a second to get my head together on this, but um, some of it uh, not related to business, but let's talk about like flipping for instance. Right. So, and then I'll get it into like more of a business sense, but like, like, this is specific to house flipping, right. Um, Construction. Nobody got into real estate investing because they wanted to do construction. (laughs) So now is, but however, unless you're just buying turnkey properties or putting 20% down somewhere, you're invested as an LP, like limited partner. uh, And you're a very passive investor, which is sometimes hard to do in real estate. Then typically you're doing something of some sort of value add, which requires construction, right? I wanted to know nothing about it forever. And I'm unfortunately an expert in it. uh, And I never wanted to be. So that said, back to the construction. Um, Something that we did that we learned through our after action reports, which took us years to learn through because we weren't looking close enough, was that our biggest hangups, our biggest issues in our project all came in with like rough in trades, right? So this is something that we learned pretty quick, like not quick, sorry. It took us probably five years before we figured this out that the rough in trades were messing us up all the time. And so our plumbers and our electricians always set us back the longest out of everybody. Right. And we kept hiring the same ones over and over again. We kept thinking that cheaper is better. Right. So because oh, yeah. we all want fast, cheap quality, yeah. but in reality, you only get two. Right. So I am. And I'm, so I kept getting these trades that I might get an electrician in there that says 10 grand to wire a house. But this other guy said six. So I'm going to go with the yeah. six. Right. Yeah. So but yet that six thousand dollar guy takes, you know, two months and headaches and pisses off all your other trades. Right. And then your your ten thousand dollar guy would have been done in two days and got along with everybody. Right. So. So a constant mistake over and over again was going for cheaper trades 
uh, because I'm an investor. I, the way I make money is to spend as little as possible on this entire transaction. Yep. But the, the downside of that is that if you're not getting the quality you need, right, and you're creating more headaches for yourself and more stress because you're going cheap, then, you know, that can affect your business in the long run, especially if you multiply that over 20, 30, 40 houses. Uh, and, and it requires, anyways, there's, there's a bigger story there. But um, some of the other ones that have been good learning lessons and mistakes. Like I've had a contractor run off with almost $40,000 of a deposit right on a house and never to be seen again. Uh, why did that happen? Was back in the day when I was early on in the business, I think this was 2012 when this happened, 2012 or 2013. Uh, everybody said they needed 50% deposits, right? Yep. So you get a bid for 80 grand and they needed 50% down as the GC. And I'm like, cool. All right. Yeah. That's what we've always done. So no big deal. Here's 50% down. Uh, no real contract other than their invoice, like, and that's it. Right. And, uh, and then that person's gone. Right. And the, and like, Oh, sue him, arrest him. Cool. Good luck with that shit. Good right. Luck, yeah. yeah. When you want to find him, but yeah, that was a mistake. And what did we learn from that? I don't give 50% down anymore. Right. And I also don't give anybody money without a contract and their license and bond and insurance and everything else. Like, and it's all been uh, checked and rechecked. So we have a whole process built out now for onboarding contractors that help you know, prevent things like that from happening again. Um, we've given a tremendous amount of advice for our contractors that have backfired on us over the years. Um, we've definitely made some major mistakes of like in Seattle buying houses that are, that we think we could finish a basement out. We buy it in the summer. And then when we wrap up the project in the winter, uh, the basement is flooded because it floods in the winter and you have a fully finished basements and stuff and you don't even realize that's going to happen. So that's happened more than once. Uh, you learn from that and you learn to waterproof basements at that point. Money wise, um, you know, bookkeeping is probably the biggest thing that I think most people that get in this business forget about. The only yep. time I've seen people that try to do it themselves or correct. Yeah. The, the people that I've found that do it the best are the ones that start out with the intention of only buying rentals. Right. And, or they're forced into it because they start a syndication or something like that. Cause they have to legally like uh, bring the books out. Yep. Um, but if they buy rentals and they're, and they're buying volume rentals, they have to keep bookkeeping because they're making 200 bucks, 300 bucks. They're managing, it's all about ROI, rate of return. And they're making 8%, 10% of their money. And they're managing that they're, and they're calculating vacancy and capital expenditures and like all that kind of crap. Not all of them, trust me, but like the, the ones that are doing volume are more focused on that. And so they're better at their books, house flippers and value add people and people that are just grinding wholesalers, people like that keep the worst books in the world right they just want to they make money they make bank and they'll figure it out later right yep. and so i spent years as that person uh and then i spent years fixing it so for and it's the looking back like i've done some coaching with some uh higher level investors over the years where i'm coaching them and without fail like the most i'm usually spending most of my time coaching on uh the back-end business side of finances and uh, accounting and bookkeeping and systemizing and strategizing around that because we're investors. And sometimes we forget about that and investing means numbers and money, right? right so, right. and it, if you're not an ex, yeah, if you, your business is financials, like, and if you don't know how much you made on a property or if you're profiting or not, but there's money in the bank account, yeah. well, that doesn't mean shit. So yeah. it could be, you could have nothing in there actually yeah. and not even be realize it. So that money go. Yeah, where did it all go? I thought we had money. I, I can still, I used to flip a lot of houses. I can still remember like many Christmases, probably three, maybe even four Christmases in a row, like my mother in law's house doing the books, like sitting there going through it. I got like a stack <laughs> like this big and I'm like, yeah. trying to finish it all as much as quick as I can because I didn't keep track of anything. You know, it's like, oh my gosh. Oh, that's the most common common thing i've seen from yeah. especially people that do you know flipping or value add in some way uh is they just go right and they're just rushing and going and then they figure out the finances later or the books yep. later and that that is something that has to be figured out eventually and yep. it needs to be figured out sooner than later my last big mistake which i can go i mean i've lost money on houses i mean there's always mistakes on that like we you know my biggest one was 86 grand on one house in uh, uh portland oregon that was a big mistake i spent you know, two years flipping a house that was 
$300,000 rehab. And I lost, yeah. I think five or 10 grand on that one after it. So it's always great to lose money on a house that you spend two years working on. Oh, yeah. But the, but the, but the bigger ones is mistakes is realizing who the bottleneck is in the business and, and coming to terms that the biggest enemy in my company is me and, and my bad habits. And despite my team, which we have a great team and it's fluctuated over the years, it's gone big, small, and now it's a little bit bigger again, uh, right now, cause of what we're doing, but, the um, almost all our issues come back to me where I'm like, wait, it's my fault. I'm the one that did that. Or I wasn't clear on that, or I wasn't, uh, or we didn't have a right process for that, or I'm the bottleneck and I'm sitting on it and everybody's waiting for me and like, and accepting to get my ego out of the way and let other people thrive in the business. So being able to raise my leadership level has been challenging for me, but it's also the biggest payoff in my business is becoming a better leader. There's a great book that you know everybody should read at least 10 times and that's Extreme Ownership yep. uh, by Jocko Willink and Leif Babin. And, and just follow that and make your team read it, make everybody be a part of it. And if people don't want to fit that mold, that extreme ownership mold, they're probably a bad person to have on your team, in my opinion, but they won't be allowed on my team. That's for sure. hundred yeah. percent. We've got a seven attributes of, worth our company. And one of them is that extreme ownership mm -hmm. it came from the book that you just mentioned. But if they don't want to get on board with those attributes, that's fine, but they're not on board with us. You know, okay. you have to have extreme ownership. It comes, like you said, it comes, it comes from yourself Top as down. the owner, but it has to be from everybody else too. Correct. And it, and it's, and be accepting of that. Like, and, and it's yep. the, and it's also that, so as I've learned, wait, we failed at this. If I look at it closely because of me and taking that, taking that ownership and putting my ego in check and realizing at the end of the day, I'm the one that hired that person, or I'm yep. the one that bought that house, or I'm the one that approved that lender, or I'm the one that whatever at the end of the day, or I started the company, right? So at the end of the day, it's my fault. Everything is my fault, good and bad. <laughs> so take that, take that into consideration for extreme ownership. But the um, and being able to celebrate those wins when they need to be celebrated, but also be critical on those losses and loses, and then know at the end of the day, like it's your fault, and be okay, and then learn from it, not in a self-deprecating way, but in a constructive. How can we grow from this and become better ways so we don't repeat it again? Everybody on my team knows they can screw up. They're allowed to screw up. Everybody's allowed to screw up. It's going to happen, but they need to be able to own it and be able to learn from it. And then it's not okay to keep repeating the same mistakes over and over again. It's okay to make a mistake though. And, and just as long as we know why it happened, we can learn from it and grow. That's the most important part. Yeah. Hey man, um, man, Tarl, this, this has been fantastic. You know, I've had a lot of great guests on the show. Uh, I just appreciate you being just super open, honest, uh, vulnerable. Uh, it's been, it's been amazing. I know our listeners are getting a ton of, I'm getting a ton of, I got, I got a ton of notes here that I've been writing down. So I'm going to be checking out a lot of the stuff you said, and, uh, like I've got a ton out of it. So if our listeners haven't, at least I did, uh, <laughs> I, I, I know they have, so it's, it's just been Awesome to have you on. I'm going to have you back on again because there's so many more questions, so many more things I think we can go through. Uh, you've had a ton of, of valuable lessons and, and built a pretty impressive business um, throughout the year. So I really appreciate the time um, you've given us. I got a couple last questions that I want to ask you uh, and then we'll wrap up. Um, sure. All right. So what's your favorite book that you can recommend? I know you've uh, mentioned uh, a punch, but maybe, yeah. maybe one that you haven't mentioned. Favorite book. Um, well, my three business books was, you know, one thing four hour work week and, uh, and checklist manifesto. Um, the extreme ownership is one of my favorite leadership books. Uh, favorite, book. I got so many books, dude. Like what would be one that, Oh, I actually have to say this. The only book I've ever read. And then immediately, and I don't listen to books. I reread books. Uh, I immediately went back to page one and read it again was can't hurt me by David Goggins. Ooh, it's a great book. Oh, uh, like if you don't want to like start, if you, <laughs> if you read that book and you don't feel like, a, like, like you're the biggest POS there is like, yeah. 
right you you're not really reading it <laughs> so <laughs> like you're like oh i'm such a weak lead i need to get shot up <laughs> like that book fires you up like at least it should and it makes you uh you know at least for me like it made me go like there's a lot more stuff i can handle here <laughs> so I, yeah i love that book it was a great book i listened to that book while uh sitting in my deer stand like mm. listening to him just like oh this is does he read it is he is yes is the, it's great oh, it's great that's 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 even 10 xing it right there. You got David Goggins like, duh, 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 just and he'll back. interrupt himself sometimes. So he'll be like reading it, and then he'll interrupt himself yeah. and be like, yeah, you know, here here's some context of this part part of the story, and it'll just gotta uh -huh. go into it. Uh, I think it, I need to listen. It's great. To it. So <laughs> I'll, I'll 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 listen to that one, even though I read it twice. Like I, that's worth reading it if, yep. if David's the one reading it. So, yep, yep. On yeah, yeah, on Audible, it was good, good. All right. So last question, what are your three pillars of wealth creation? Three pillars of wealth creation. Yep. Meaning like, is that just, just like it, make it up as I go, there. right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, three pillars. So, and does, are you talking about money wealth or just what my definition of wealth? your definition be? of wealth? Yep. Let's see. Okay. So could I have like 20 of them? No. Um, the, for, so, okay, I, my definition of wealth for myself has more to do with, am I, am I doing what I believe my highest and best is at this yeah. moment? And that, that changes, right, yeah. all the time. But it's at this moment, living in the now, right? Most of our issues and most of my issues in my life have come from me living in the past or dreading the future. Mm -hmm. And there's wow. a great quote that I got from uh, Dale Carnegie. That said, my no, no, sorry, it's from a Dale Carnegie book that I read it, but the quote's from Mark Twain. Sorry, Mark Twain is the one that said it. My life has been full of terrible misfortunes, most of which have never happened. <laughs> Too sure. <laughs> and I would absolutely say that's one of my first pillars as far as my personal wealth and health and mental well being is being here and now with you on this podcast in the moment not thinking about what I'm doing after, not thinking yeah. what I, what I didn't do before, right. Not regretting, right. Even though I still struggle with all that stuff and we all do anxiety, most entrepreneurs suffer from anxiety because it's the, it's the fear of the future yep. and depression is the, um, the regret of the past basically. So that's why I got and, this gray hair. <laughs> correct. Right. So, um, big wake up call for me over the years was the yeah. focus on here and now this is today's all we got. Right. Yeah. And in that ex you know, I went down a whole path of like, what happens if I die? Like, as far as you can die today, right? Are you going to be regretful of that? And what are you leaving on the table if that's the case? Mm -hmm. So most of us was William Wallace said, right? I believe from Braveheart, it's just like, you know, most men have never lived or whatever. Kind of, I don't remember. He had some famous quote in Braveheart, like where he lived and most people don't, right? Yep. So, you know, what is that? So I would say that would be one of my number one uh, things out there for living my life and building wealth for myself. Um, outside of course, well, real estate is my vehicle of physical wealth. Right. And then, uh, I think the other, I mean, just experiences, I don't know how else to explain it. Like yeah. I would being able to, to, to love others, be with my family, uh, my chosen family. That's a key thing that I want to reiterate, um, creating your own family, choosing your family. That's friends. Those are colleagues. Those are people that you truly care and love. Um, I think respect is earned, not uh, required, like, and so forth. So when it comes to even your own family members, and, but being able to choose my own family, the people I around, surround myself with, and be there for them and have experiences with them, real estate and my money allows me to have better experiences <laughs> with them, and allows me to have the freedom to choose what I do in those experiences. So I'm not stressing about my bills, right? Which I've been there. I grew up super freaking broke. A lot of my family still is, and we work with them still uh, to help them get through that. But that mentality of when you're on vacation and you're not, and you're able to say, cool, let's go do that cool ass thing that we're on vacation to go do, even though it costs an extra 500 bucks or a thousand bucks, right? Having those better experiences and not dreading the future for finances to me is like everything. So, um, Definitely not three things I keep going because I don't really think about that as much. I was, I don't want to go to candid real estate, crypto stocks, like <laughs> whatever, right? Even though I love, you know, I do all that stuff too. But the, uh, 
I do those things. Those are vehicles to, to, to actually just live the life I want to live. Yeah. Love it, man. All right. So, uh, I, I lied. I got one more question. How can our listeners get in touch with you? Oh, good thing. So um, definitely not my email. Uh, and even if I gave it to you, I want an answer. <laughs> I don't look at it, right? Um, the Perfect. So Instagram uh, is definitely Tarl, at Tarl Yarber. You can follow me on Instagram. Uh, you can message us, uh, message me on there. Either I or my assistant will get back in touch with you, hopefully. Unless it's like you're begging for all my time and rewarding nothing back. But, the, yep. uh, the, but Instagram, at Tarl Yarber. Uh, the Limitless Expo, so limitlessexpo.com is where you go to discover our new financial freedom expo that we're doing with Ken McElroy and Robert Kiyosaki. Uh, that's coming up in June, June 9th, 10th, and 11th. Um, and also Bigger Pockets. You can find me on biggerpockets.com as well. And on their Bigger Pockets YouTube channel, I'm one of the lead contributors for their videos there. Uh, if you want to see more, I do actually read those comments on the videos and I do respond to people on those. So, wow. um, but go. the, uh, but we're there as well. So those are the best ways to get in touch with me one way or another. Love it. Love it. Well, Tarl, really appreciate it. Uh, look forward to, I, I'm going to have to sign up for the Limitless Expo. Look forward to being able to meet you a person face-to-face there again. Um, man, tons of great stuff. Again, really appreciate you being on the show. You have a fantastic rest of the day. Todd, thank you. And thank you for having me on. Hey, thanks so much for listening. I appreciate you being a loyal listener. Say, I would love to have you go on to our Facebook page and subscribe, uh, give us a thumbs up, go on to iTunes or wherever you listen and give us a rating and review. Don't forget to subscribe. It's a rating and review just helps us push this out to more and more people and continue to grow our audience and hopefully positively affect a ton of people out there that really need this and and want this. So uh, the other thing I've got for you is a free ebook on my website. So go on to VentureDProperties.com, VentureDProperties.com and download our free ebook uh, on real estate and on syndication. And I've got some data points in there, some really good stuff for you. So I'd love to have you take a look at that. It's free. I'm not expecting anything from it. Uh, and, and also, look, if you want some help in multifamily, want some help learning, growing, getting your business off the ground, I would love to talk to you about what it would look like uh, to work with me potentially and see if that's a good fit. So you can go up to coachwithdex.com and check that out and uh, we can definitely have a, uh, a call. Thanks a lot for listening. You make it a fantastic rest of the day. I'll catch you on the next episode.